Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. Nairobi Garage is Africa's largest and coolest business and innovation workspace with two locations across Nairobi and one coming up really soon in Westlands. We host webinars to educate our ecosystem. Today is the World IP Day, today being the 26th of April and uh, we are proud to host O&M Law LLP to take us through this webinar. Karibu Sana, today we will be having uh, two speakers. So our host and moderator is going to be Kevin Kwasa, who will be introducing Andrew Ndikimi, who will be our main, uh, who will be our main host. Karibu Sana and welcome. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you so much, Evelyn, for, for the great introduction and good morning to everyone who has joined in. I'm uh, so happy to see so many people interested in our in the talk that we have today. Um, uh, as, as she said, today is World IP Day, and we're very glad to be here. I'm Kevin Kwasa, I'm a partner here at Quantum Law LLP, heading the commercial department. Uh, and uh, as is on them law LLP, we're a, we're a law firm based in Nairobi that deals that deals in full service uh, gives a full service offering, and we're also part of a very interesting initiative called Asiri. Uh, here at Asiri, we are a couple of uh, uh, an alliance of firms that uh, provide professional services. Um, and with our motto being that we always strive to be in every event, in everything we do, bold, innovative, and dynamic. Um, we have uh, we, we have constituent farms that uh, range from pro providing very professional services from company secretarial services, uh, financial and audit services, um, uh, commercial advisory services, as well as legal services by myself. And if you can see there, you, you'll see uh, a couple of stickers of uh, our constituent farms. Uh, so we hope that we will be able to get in touch with, with all of you and provide you more with better with even better services as we go along but for now i want to now go on to the matter at hand which is intellectual property and we've come a long way as a as a as humanity from the bronze age when we were fighting with swords and when gold was uh, the greatest uh, resource and now we're in the information age when information is one of the greatest resources so protecting that information should be something that everyone puts a, a great premium on and to speak on this um i want i'm uh, honored to introduce andrew dikimi who is uh, the head of our intellectual practice here at OM Law. He has a wealth of experience handling uh, intellectual property matters, both within Kenya and regionally uh, in East Africa. He's recognized as an intellectual property expert by various international institutions, including WIPO. And as far as I'm concerned, he's one of the most knowledgeable people I've ever dealt with as far as intellectual property is concerned. So uh, I'll now hand it over to you, Andrew, uh, and we will, we'll, I think we'll, uh, you can go along with the presentation or we'll take questions after. Okay, thanks a lot, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. As Kevin mentioned, my names are Andrew Ndikimi, I'm a partner and I head the intellectual property department at ONM Law. Today, I will present to you a webinar on intellectual property rights registration and enforcement in Kenya. I was supposed to do the presentation together with uh, Patrick Ogola, who's our managing partner but due to unforeseen reasons, he was not able to join us this morning, but I'll be able to take you through the presentation. 
and I welcome you all to this presentation. So the first question that I want to pose to each and every participant of this webinar is, what is intellectual property? So intellectual property is property, like any other property, be it an idea, a process, or an invention that derives from the work of the mind or the intellect. Hence, the word intellectual property. So intellectual property is just like any other property, like you would have your treasured asset, your car, your piece of land, ETC. The same way you can own a title document or a logbook to your vehicle, it's the same way that you can own intellectual property rights, subject to certain uh, procedures that uh, we'll see as we go along. So examples of intellectual property include song lyrics, computer programs, manufacturing processes, and just to mention but a few. So what are intellectual property rights? Again, the term is derived from the definition that we've just uh, discussed of intellectual property. So these are the rights emanating from your intellectual property. So basically, an idea in your mind is not protectable and is not registrable until you reduce it to some tangible form. So once you reduce it to some tangible form, be it in a written medium, in a flash disk, in a CD-ROM, or in an actual product, when, for example, you have an idea of a product, that's the only time that it actually becomes registrable. And through registration, you own the exclusive right to use that particular intellectual property right. So an idea in the mind does not give you any form of protection. You need to reduce it into some tangible form for you to be able to register it as your intellectual property right with the various uh, registration bodies that we'll see as we go along, which include Kipi, Kekobo, and the rest. So just I need to mention at this point in time that uh, we'll have a question and answer session towards the tail end. So you can jot down your questions and we'll be able to address them ably towards the tail end of this presentation. So we will begin with the legislation that governs intellectual property and intellectual property rights in Kenya. The first statute is the Constitution of Kenya 2010 and Article 11, Article 2C, which deals with culture, provides that the state shall promote the intellectual property rights of the people of Kenya. Further, Article 40, Article 5, which deals with the protection of right to property, provides that the state shall support, promote, and protect the intellectual property rights of the people of Kenya. So the constitution is the grand norm in the Republic of Kenya. So it's the primary law and it actually recognizes and protects intellectual property rights. The second legislation is the Industrial Property Act 2001. Basically, it provides for various forms of intellectual property rights, which we'll discuss in detail later on in this webinar. So it provides for patents, utility models, industrial designs, and just to mention but a few. So these are types of intellectual property rights, which by the end of this uh, webinar, you will be able to easily identify and distinguish between these various types of uh, intellectual property rights. Again, the same statute establishes the Kenya Industrial Property Institute, or KIPI. So this is the government agency where we usually register 
patents, utility models, industrial designs, and trademarks. The other legislation that touches on intellectual property rights is the Trademarks Act 2002, and it provides or it deals with trademarks which are registrable at KIPI. The other statute or legislation is the Copyright Act 2001, which deals with copyright matters. And the government agency concerned with registration of copyrights is the Kenya Copyright Board, or Kekobo, as is usually called. The other statute is the Seed and Plant Varieties Act, Cap 326 Laws of Kenya. So this deals with plant breeders' rights, which we'll discuss again in more details later on. And the same are registrable at the Kenya Plant Health Inspectorate Services, or KEFIS, which is located along Gong Road. And last but not least, in terms of legislation, we have the Anti-Counterfeit Act 2008, which deals with all matters pertaining to, to anti-counterfeiting in Kenya. And it also establishes the Anti-Counterfeit Agency, which is the agency mandated to deal with all matters pertaining to counterfeits, including but not limited to uh, prosecution, arrest, detention, raids, and all other matters pertaining to counterfeit products in Kenya. So besides the legislation that we've discussed, there are other government agencies which are involved with IP or intellectual property rights enforcement. And one such department is the Weights and Measures Department, which is established under the Ministry of Trade. And it enforces the provisions of the Trade Description Act, which statutes inter alia prohibits misdescription of goods provided in the course of trade, included but not limited to counterfeits. And this is the same department that is concerned with calibration of weighing scales when you go to your local meat store, the weighing scale must have a certificate confirming that it has been calibrated and inspected by this particular department. So it's one of the channels of, again, consumer protection and protection of intellectual property rights because most of the counterfeit goods, for example, you will find that uh, because they've been uh, produced using an illegal process, the weight indicated on the item, for example, will not be the correct weight or the description they are in. The other department is the Customs Service Department, which is the department within the Kenya Revenue Authority or the KRA. It's responsible for the facilitation of legitimate trade and protection of the society from illegal entry, from counterfeits and parallel imports or great products and their role is mainly instrumental at the entry of border points in Kenya. And again, they are concerned with the tax declaration and ensuring that duty with regards to all goods imported into Kenya is paid ATC. Then last but not least, we have the Kenya Bureau of Standards or KEMS, which is established under the Standards Act. And the preamble of the act states that it's a legislation to promote the standardization of the specialization of commodities, sorry, the specification of commodities, and to provide for the standardization of commodities and codes of practice. It also establishes CAPS, or the Kenya Bureau of Standards. It defines CAPS functions and provides for its management and control and for matters incidental thereto and connected with that. KEPS is mandated to, amongst other things, provide for the testing of locally manufactured and imported commodities 
with a view to determine whether such commodities comply with the provisions of the Standards Act or any other law dealing with standards of quality or description. So basically, they confirm that goods comply with the standards required. Again, they also, all these statutes have an impact or a role to play with regard to protection of consumers and also protection of intellectual property rights, uh, proprietors or owners. So the question would be, as I mentioned earlier, what are the various types of intellectual property rights in Kenya? So basically, these are trademarks, patents, utility models, industrial designs, plant breeders' rights, and other, a few others, uh, intellectual property rights, as we will see as we progress with uh, this webinar. And we will touch on and describe the nature of each intellectual property right, where it's registrable, and also the validity of the protection that you get from the law. So the first IP right that we'll discuss will be trademarks. And uh, each of you interact with these on a daily basis. You will get them on billboards as you go to work, go back home. So it's the most common type of uh, intellectual property right. So trademark registration is effected at Kipi, which is located along Oyaki Way. So the relevant statute is the Trademarks Act, and it defines a trademark as a distinguishing guise, slogan, device, brand, heading, label, ticket, name, signature, word, letter, or numerical, or any combination thereof, whether rendered in a two-dimensional or three-dimensional form. Again, I'll show you some types of uh, all these descriptions of trademarks that uh, we've defined. So basically, again, a trademark acts as a source of identification or a brand name. So once you register a trademark, you get a certificate of registration from Kipi valid for 10 years. It's renewable for further terms of 10 years in perpetuity. So for trademarks, you own them in perpetuity, unlike the other types of intellectual property rights that we'll discuss later on in this webinar. So you keep on renewing after every 10 years at Kipi. So what are the types and examples of trademarks. From the definition of trademarks under the Act that we uh, interacted with in the previous slides, we have various types of trademarks. The first type are device marks. And you can see like the first device mark, which is owned by Toyota. Next to it, we have another device mark which is owned by Kenya Power and Lightning Company. So these are basically some sort of pictorial representation with no numericals, no words, nothing. So we call them devices. And again, we can have a combination of word and devices we'll see later on uh, in this particular slide. The other category of trademarks are word mark or numerical marks or what we call slogans. So an example of a word mark would be the trademark Daily Nation, which is registered and owned by the Nation Media Group. An example of a numerical mark are the prefix 0722, which are registered and owned by Safaricom Limited. And as most of you will remember, this was the 
second generation prefix after 072, which was the initial Safaricom prefix. So 0722 is a numerical uh, word mark owned by Safaricom. 504 is another numerical word mark owned by the automobile Peugeot of France. And again, Peugeot owns a number of these numerical marks going by their various car models from 504, 404, and the list is endless. Then we have examples of slogans. And an example is the Pride of Africa, which again is a slogan registered and owned by Kenya Airways. The other type of trademarks are stylized words. An example is Coca-Cola. So it's basically a word which is stylized. Another example is Naivas saves you money. So these are stylized, stylized words. You realize they are a bit different from the daily nations that we've discussed above and the pride of Africa. These are stylized. Then last but not least, we have a combination of word and device. So it goes to the first type, which is a device mark, and the second type, which is a word mark. So it has a combination of both. An example is the tasker. Uh, logo of the Tasker trademark, which has the representation of the head of an elephant with the words Tasker since 1922, finest lager. Another example is the Nation Media Group logo or word and device trademark, which has the blue uh, device together with the words Nation Media Group. So those are the various types of trademarks. We also have others. So basically the previous ones are mostly two dimension. So we also have three dimension trademarks. And one of the examples of a three dimension trademark is the contour device of a Coca-Cola bottle, which is the registered trademark of Coca-Cola company. And that's why you will not come across any other beverage using a bottle similar in shape to the Coca-Cola bottle. Although again, a lot has been said about the shape of a Coca-Cola bottle. <laughs> so the other type of a 3D trademark or three dimension is City Hopper. So the way you see the colors of City Hopper, which is uh, one of the commuter buses most popular in Nairobi, you will find that the way the green and the yellowish are uh, painted on the bus is actually registered as a 3D mark at Kipi by City Hopper. That's why you will not find any other bus with such a color combination. And as you all recall, we had another shuttle which was called a City Shuttle. Eh? They tried copying colors similar to City Hopper's but City Hopper was able to stop them from using those colors through a court order because it was acknowledged that uh, those colors are City Hopper's trademarks registered as a 3D image. So we'll have a few discussions in terms of recent developments when it comes to trademark and trademark law. So Kikoi is a common type of textile in Kenya, which mostly men will tie around their waists, mostly from the coast region. And women will also use it, you know, uh, as an accessory when they dress up. So a few years ago, a UK company attempted to register the trademark Kikoi or the word Kikoi, or the name Kikoi as a trademark, the application was rejected because the word Kikoi has become generic in terms of describing such textile goods, just as Xerox is with respect to photocopying or in the world of photocopiers and uh, photocopying. 
The other interesting case that has come up over time or in the recent past is the words Hakuna Matata, which is a registered trademark of Disney Enterprises Incorporated. And this particular company has exclusive right to the use of the words Hakuna Matata when it comes to their use on clothing, footwear, and headgear. So Disney Enterprises Incorporated used these words Hakuna Matata in the famous movie Lion King and proceeded to register the words Hakuna Matata with the United States Patent and Trademarks Office in from 8th August 1994. So previously it was common to find people selling clothing with these words, but unfortunately now, since 8th August 1994, you can easily be sued if you put these words in any item that touches on clothing, footwear, and headgear. The other thing that I need to mention is that trademark registration is class specific. So we have various classes of goods and services. And in Kenya, we, we are currently using the NIST classification 10th edition. So you must register your goods or services in one of the classes and the protection will be limited to those particular goods or services. So that for example, since the Hakuna Matata trademark is registered in class 25, which covers clothing, footwear, and headgear, if you would write these words in your motor vehicle, for example, you can easily argue that Hakuna Matata is exclusively owned by Disney with regard to class 25, which only covers clothing, footwear, and headgear. And by you putting these words in a motor vehicle, you are not infringing on the class in which the trademark is registered in. But that's an argument for another day. The other thing that I need to mention about trademarks is there are certain things that you cannot have an exclusive right to use. And these are ordinary words, either in English, in vernacular, or in Swahili. So that, for example, you cannot go and attempt to register the word file or the word computer. The same applies to colors. So you cannot claim exclusive right to the use of any color. And for those who are in Kenya, we've had the usual wars between Safaricom, one of the telecommunication companies in Kenya, and uh, Airtel, where Airtel will push an advert out there depicting the green color, showing it to have a bad quality, and the red color having a superior quality. And the fight has always been that green is shows that it's Safaricom and red is Airtel. And sometimes Safaricom will also put out adverts out there showing someone with a red t-shirt, you know, with a phone which has a poor quality network. Again, trying to depict the other, uh, trying to belittle the other competitor. Again, uh, the colors sometimes also have an impact in terms of products because like in the tobacco industry, the color red shows a strong brand of cigarettes. The color green will show an element of menthol in that particular brand of cigarettes. The color blue will show a mild brand of cigarettes. So again, in the Kenyan case of British American Tobacco versus Cut Tobacco Kenya Limited, it was observed that the use of the color red as a predominant color in the packet of a cigarette is not an exclusive preserve of anyone, including the plaintiff. The color being a conventional indicator in the tobacco industry of a strong brand of cigarettes. So this again goes to illustrate that uh, you cannot claim exclusive use of any particular color, any ordinary word, any ordinary letter, but a combination of all can actually give you some sort of protection. Then still on trademarks, we have 
other types of trademarks which are known as well-known marks. Again, well-known marks are protected under the Trademarks Act, and the Act grants the proprietors of well-known marks the right to restrain by way of injunction the use in Kenya of a trademark which is identical or similar to the well-known mark in relation to identical or similar goods or services. So these are marks that have become well known over time. An example would be Red Bull. Uh, so let me see what's inside there that needs to be sent. Except for the lease. Hello? Hello? Ah, sorry, my, my I have some microphone issues. So thank you, thank you so much, Andrew, for for that. Uh, and this is just to remind everyone on the webinar that we do have a section. Uh, we do have a, a place where you can post your questions. Uh, so feel free to post your questions and uh, and, and give us feedback as we're going along. Uh, I know I know we said we'd take questions at the end, Andrew, but I've seen two questions that I think are pretty interesting that maybe we can touch on before we leave. Uh, we go to the copyright section. Uh, I see one boy has asked whether she says her trademark expires in 2024. At which point should she refresh it and, and what would happen if she lets it lapse? Maybe you can ask, ask the answer that for. Yes, Kevin, that's a lot. So one boy, you need to flag up your trademark uh, when it but it, when it expires in 2024 you need to re to renew it before it expires however there's usually a grace period that you're given upon its expiry before the mark is expunged from the trademarks uh, register and again the registrar of trademarks has a legal obligation to send out a notice which is usually sent out in the kipi journal uh, uh, setting out marks which are long overdue for renewal and have not been renewed. And in the notice, the Registrar of Trademark gives the proprietors a certain timeline within which to renew the marks, failing which they will be expunged from the register. So there's a well, uh, a clear cut procedure in terms of expunging unrenewed marks from the registrar, and it doesn't just happen. You, a, a notice will be sent to you, and ordinarily Kip will also send a letter to you inviting you to either renew and advising you that failing to renew, they will proceed and uh, expand it from the record. The downside is sometimes we'll find that you registered for the mark using an agent, but sometimes the notice may not get to you. And that's why it's very important to have a lawyer or appoint a lawyer to manage your trademark portfolio. So they'll be able to be checking the KIPI journal. And in the event that there's a notice that is issued with regards to the expiry of any of your mark, they'll be able to raise that issue with you and handle the renewal on your behalf. The other important thing of having a lawyer do what we call a trademark watch is anytime the KIPI journal comes out, they'll check the advertised marks because there's an obligation to advertise a mark uh, before it's registered. So they'll check, and in case there's a mark which is similar or closely similar to your mark, which might con cause a confusion in the marketplace, they can easily uh, pinpoint this mark to you and you can be able to file the necessary uh, objections or oppositions to the registration of any new mark which you feel make be similar or confusingly similar to your trademark. I believe I've answered our boy's question. Yeah, I think, I think, I think that, that is a pretty comprehensive answer. I've seen uh, we have Christabel as well, who has a very pressing question on what aspects of software can be patented and can this be done for an ERP system as well? Would you want to address that now? Yes, yes, I would want to address that. So again, Christabel, to answer you, initially, because our intellectual property legislation, the legislations that I've just discussed, we've not really been very aggressive in terms of amending them to be in line with the international standards. However, I must mention, in the pipeline, we, Kenya is in the process of unionizing all our intellectual property laws so that we have one statute which covers 
all types of intellectual property uh, rights and matters emanating therefrom. Huh? So you'll find that initially we used to register uh, softwares under copyright because our statute has not been amended to recognize other forms of patents. In most of the other countries, you'll find that softwares are actually registered as patents. So however, uh, because of the international uh, trends and standards, uh, and all the Kekobo and keep it trying to keep up with the international trends and standards. Uh, so currently, Kipi is able to register your software as a patent, provided that you meet the patent threshold, which is you must show that there's some novelty and have a statement of claim. So we'll discuss patents. It's actually the next slide in a little bit more detail. So yes, it is possible for you to register softwares in Kenya as patents, or what we used to do when we used to register them as copyright was we would reduce it into some form of writing or a booklet with a description of how the software works and screenshots of each window within that software. Then you register that booklet with the Kenya Copyright Book as a book, as it were. But currently it's possible, so as so long as you prove that it's innovative and it's novel, you can be able to register your software as a patent. I believe I've answered Christabel. Okay, that, th th thanks so much uh, for addressing those two. Um, guys, uh, um, once again, feel free to put, post your questions. If you, if you look at your chat, there's a special tab there for questions, so you can put them there and we'll address them during the Q&A. And as well, there is a poll that is up, so you can, you can give us some answers to the poll so we can get some feedback on, on where everyone is on intellectual property and how to address issues, some of the issues there. So I'm going to, you can continue. Okay, thanks a lot, Kevin, for that. And uh, again, I reiterate, keep those questions coming because our intention is to keep this uh, webinar as interactive as, as possible uh, because we are here to learn and exchange knowledge and educate each other. So again, I was on the well-known max. So examples are Red Bull and Coca-Cola and uh, also contextually, for those in Kenya, we have had uh, some marks which are well known, such that they became a more like a generic name. Like nowadays, we'll even find in our local dailies, when they want to refer to our 14-seater Matatus, eh, they'll call them a Nissan Matatu. So actually, Nissan is a Nissan's registered trademark. So, but when you look at the 14-seaters, you would have a Nissan Caravan, Nissan hears and just to mention but a few, but Nissan has become a generic word for our 14 Sita Matatu. The other well-known mark or generic mark would be Omo, where a few years back any powder detergent was called Omo, be it toss, be it Persil, you just hear guys saying, do you have Omo? Another example is Blue Band, where Blue Band became almost a generic name for all margarine, whereas we had Prestige and a lot of other margarines. So again, in Kenya, in the Kenyan context, Nissan, Omo, Blue Band, we can classify them as well-known marks. So we go to the second type of uh, IP right, which is a copyright. And again, we all interact with the copyright on a day-to-day -day basis. So it basically it's the work of art or authorship. Uh, the term of protection depends on the type of copyright. So for literally musical and artistic works, other than photographs, the term of protection is 50 years after the end of the year in which the author dies. So time starts running after the author dies. And that's why we've had a lot of old school music or what we call Zinizopendwa. They've been, we've had other uh, renditions of Zinizopendwa. And this is either after the, the authors or the, um, the new authors as it were, getting permission from the estate of the deceased authors or upon the lapse of the 50 years. So we, we, we are talking about the likes of uh, Malaika, which are which were quite popular songs. Uh, the other type of uh, copyright 
and its term is uh, audiovisual works or photographs, which term of protection is 50 years from the end of the year in which the work was either made or was first made available to the public or was first, first published, whichever day is the latest. Then we also have sound recordings, which protection is 50 years after the end of the year in which the recording was made. The other one is broadcast, like we have our usual daily news bulletins and all. So the term of protection is 50 years after the end of the year in which the broadcast took place. Registration is effected at KEKOBO, the Kenya Copyright Board, and you get a registration certificate upon registering your work. So examples of copyrights are literary works, musical works, including any wording, dramatic words, including any music, uh, pantomimes, which are performance using gestures or body movements without words, choreographic works, which are or rather these are artistic dancing or dance moves. So we have pictorial graphics, sculptural works, motion pictures, audiovisual works, sound recordings, and architectural works. So these are types of uh, copyrights. Then the other type is patents. And again, these are registrable at KIPI. And uh, basically, an invention is patentable if it's new, involves an in, in inventive step, and is industrially applicable. An invention shall be considered as involving an in, sorry, an invention shall be considered as involving an in, inventive step if having regard to the prior art relevant to the application claiming the invention it would not have been obvious to a person skilled in the art to which the invention pertains on the date of the filing of the application, or if priority is claimed on the priority date val validly claimed in respect thereof. So basically, when you look at patents, you're looking at invention. So when, when we talk about priority, so this is, for example, when you file it in a different jurisdiction and you have some sort of protection. So when you want to file it again in Kenya, you can claim priority, stating that you had previously registered it in a different jurisdiction. So when you look at patents, you are looking at invention. And again, as I mentioned, KIPI has actually started uh, registering software as patents. Though initially we used to do them as uh, copyrights. So again, a patent is an invention that is a solution to a specific problem in the field of technology. So again, Christabel, this answers your question on the protection of your software. So in terms of the term of the patent, it expires 20 years from application date. So unlike trademarks, which so long as you renew, you're entitled to it in perpetuity, there is no right of renewal. So the assumption is that within the 20 years, you will have uh, gotten all your commercial benefit that you ought to have gotten from this innovation or technology, paid yourself for your invention, and then allow the invention to be used by the whole world so that technology can continue progressing and people can benefit from this invention. An example would be generic drugs. So basically generic drugs are not uh, inferior drugs or they are not substandard drugs. So basically, these are drugs where the patent protection lapsed and it's a free for all. So anyone can use that and uh, develop uh, any such generic medicine or drugs. So again, something interesting on patents is that Tiondo is so unique to Kenya because it's uh, one of those traditional bags for carrying luggage and uh, most of the all communities used to have a, a, a leather strap which you would uh, carry the kyondo on your back. So apparently kyondo is a patent registered in Japan. So Japan were able to register it before Kenya actually registered, it, registered the kyondo. In as much as uh, the kyondo is so, you know, it, it, it's so Kenyan, even the word itself. So again, examples of um, patents, we have on the photo a uh, hippo water roller. So basically it's a 
a jelly can where you put water, then you just roll it uphill. It becomes easy to transport water uphill and downhill uh, without uh, feeling the weight, really. So other examples of patterns are the bottle top and the paper matchstick invention. So these are just examples of uh, patterns. So the other form of IP right is uh, utility models. Again, these are registrable at uh, KIPI. And uh, a utility model is any form, configuration, or disposition of element of some applicants, utensils, tools, electrical or electronic circuitry, instrument, handicraft mechanism, or other object, or any part of the same, allowing a better or different functioning, use, or manufacture of the subject matter or that gives some utility advantage, environmental benefit, saving or technical effect not available in Kenya before and including microorganisms and other self-replicable uh, materials, products of uh, genetic resources, herbal as well as nutritional formulation, which give new effect. So it's some sort of a, a lesser patent, as it were, in very loose terms. Eh? So again, its term, uh, it expires 10 years after the date of filing. Again, no right of renewal, reasoning being the same as the one for patent. Uh, the, the inventor has already de derived the commercial benefit they ought to have derived, and the invention goes back to the whole world for the whole world to benefit. So examples of utility models are uh, the padlock, which is usually opened using a code, and our normal uh, electric uh, heater kettle. So the other form of intellectual property right is the industrial design. Again, these are registrable at KIPI. So it, it, it's more of aesthetics uh, and ornamental features. So it's any combination of lines or colors or any 3D form, whether or not associated with colors or lines. So again, it expires 15 years from the application date but with a right of renewal for two further terms of five years each. So industrial design gives you a potential protection of uh, 25 years after, after which it's, not, uh, it's no longer renewable. So examples of the same are the designs of a mobile phone, uh, like we have the Nokia, that was actually Nokia's industrial uh, design, which the pictorial representation you can see at the middle is what Nokia actually used for their actual application in one of the countries. Then you also have that design of an um, outdoor chair. So those are examples of uh, industrial designs. So you also have the bottle with uh, when you pop up, then you can uh, drink whatever liquid is there. It's another example of an industrial design. The sandak shoe, full with the wheels, looks like a car. Again, that's an industrial design which is which has been registered here. And we also have uh, that small stool. So those are just examples of industrial design. And you can see they go towards the design and uh, aesthetics of the product itself. So other forms of IP rights. So we have plant breeders' rights. These are registered at KEFIS. And again, I mentioned the principal statute. So basically, these touch on new plant varieties. So the period within which the right can be exercised shall not exceed 25 years. But as regard fruit trees and root stock, forest and ornamental trees and grapevine, the right should be for a period of not less than 18 years, but for all other plant varieties, the period shall, shall, shall be not less than 15 years. If on the application of the holder of any plant breeder's right, an authorized officer is satisfied that for any reasons beyond the control of the applicant, such holder has not been adequately remunerated by the grant of the right, such officer may extend the period for which such rights are accessible, subject to such restriction, condition, and other provisions, if any, as the officer concerned may think appropriate. So, however, that the period as extended shall not exceed 25 years, and where the period as extended is less than 25 years, no further extension shall be made. So again, the whole essence of the 25 years or whatever period that you're given is to ensure that 
you derive the commercial benefit of your new breed and once you derive your commercial benefit leave it out for the whole world to benefit so an example of this which uh, we handled is the red pineapple variety which uh, was actually uh, uh, developed by del monte so basically it's a red uh, pineapple which belongs to del monte it's more prone to rather it's more resistant to diseases then it's more juicier more tastier and so it's a basically an improved variety of the usual uh, creamy yellowish pineapples that we are used to so those are uh, uh, that, that's what we refer to as plant breeders uh, rights. Then we have other forms of IP, which are geographical indications. Again, they have an appellation of origin, like we have Kenyan coffee, Ethiopian coffee. Then we also have integrated circuit rights, which are layout designs of uh, integrated circuits. When you open your radios, your phones at the back, you'll see all those integrated circuits. We also have other forms of IP rights, which are trade secrets, which is uh, proprietary information. And again, closely related to trade, trade secrets, we can also discuss uh, confidential information, which again goes down to non-disclosure agreements and the rest. So in an overview, that's the whole realm of intellectual property rights in Kenya. And now the floor is open for any questions that uh, viewers may have with regard to that presentation. Th thank you, Andrew, so much. Thank you for that uh, great presentation. There, I do see some questions are coming in, uh, trickling in on the chat. Uh, I can see uh, Rajesh has asked uh, on the software copyright, once you have submitted the copyright for source code confirmation, and and you make changes to the original source code afterwards do you have to copyright the software again uh, that's one question i asked and then melab aseneka also asks uh, as on co as far as covid19 vaccines and medicines are concerned is it only up to the owners to waive the patents or how can the rest of the world benefit before the time limit, limit of 18 years of protection lapses over to you Okay, just to answer uh, Rajesh, first of all, I would not advise you to submit your software source code to anyone because uh, with a software uh, source code, it becomes very easy for anyone to use this information and develop a similar software because the source codes are the actual meat in the software. So again, as I said, uh, initially, we used to do this at Kekobo, where we would reduce, uh, we'd have a very brief description of how the software works and the various screenshots, then submit it as a booklet to Kekobo. Uh, but currently, we are moving away from Kekobo and we are doing more of uh, software registration at Kipi. So, to answer you, Rajesh, first of all, uh, I would not advise you to include source codes in uh, whatever document that you're using to register your software. And again, I would advise you, again, subject to meeting the patent threshold, uh, because the problem with uh, the main issue why we have with the Copyright Act is uh, when we come to registration of patents, uh, there is an examination a process. So for copyright, you can basically register anything. You can handwrite a letter to anyone and just go to Kekobo and Kekobo will register it. So they don't run it against the previously registered uh, soft, uh, or rather uh, copyright. But for patent, it has a very strict uh, process where once you file it, the examiner has to run your invention against already registered patents. So there is an examination process. So it's they interrogate uh, your application. So by the time you're being granted your patent certificate, you are sure that there's been a robust examination process, interrogation process, and 
it's ascertained that you're the only one who owns that. So for softwares, I would advise that we move from copyright and embrace more uh, patenting. I hope that I've answered you, Rajesh. So for source code, I would not advise you to disclose that to anyone. Then we have Melab. So again, um, for the COVID vaccine, the reason why we have this protection is uh, as an inventor, you need to derive commercial benefit from your invention. In as much as your invention is beneficial to everyone. So what happens is you're given the exclusivity to use your product for that period of time, be 20 years or whatever period of time. So even with the example of the COVID vaccine, so even the inventor of the COVID vaccine, I'll still be the exclusive supplier or manufacturer of this vaccine until the lapse of my patent. After the lapse of my patent, then it will be a free for all. So I hope I've answered your question, Melab. So the owner, in as much as the, whatever invention is there might be beneficial or might be a matter of life and death. If, for example, I come up with a COVID cure, I'll still be entitled to be the exclusive producer of that cure until I exhaust my patent term. Then I can see there's a question from George Kimovo. George Kimovo asks, please comment on the jurisdictional limitation, if any, of trademark protection. For example, can I register a trademark in Kenya and get protection within East Africa, or must I register in each jurisdiction? So George, to answer you, trademark protection is class specific. However, we have certain regimes which are region specific. So you can decide to register it under our national phase where you only get protection in Kenya. And if you want protection in Tanzania, Uganda, and other East African countries, you must register in these individual countries in the independently or individually. Or you can opt to go for the regional uh, registration regimes where we have WIPO for the Madrid system, which allows you to select, you register it at KIPI, but you can select other countries which are WIPO member countries. So examples of these regional uh, registration regimes are WIPO, ARIPO, and OAPI, depending on the countries that you want to register in. But the national phase is country specific. I believe I've answered your question, uh, George. So I can see another question from uh, Simon, and he asks, uh, the Kobe corporate application has been known to be a little difficult and confusing for new applicants. Is there a how-to guide that someone can watch to learn how to use it correctly? In fact, uh, Simon, from all the bodies that I've mentioned, registration at Kekobo is the easiest, because all you need to do is fill in a form, pay the requisite fees, and accompany your application with whatever, whether it's a book, a CD, or whatever that you want uh, registered against. The reason I'm saying Kekobo is the easiest is uh, the rest for KIPI and KEFIS, they have a robust examination process where they run your invention through existing the existing registered or the existing register. So for Kekobo, they don't do that. You basically just take your application, pay the requisite fee. If it's music, just have a copy of your song on CD. Then they will give it some sort of a reference number. You'll be given a registration certificate with that reference number. So Kikobo registration is actually the easiest. So you just need to visit them. They will give you the application form. Go with a tangible a form of your, IP, of your IP right, be it a CD, be it a book, be it whatever. Uh, I, they, they usually require a number of copies of the same. File your application. There's no examination process. So within a few weeks, you'll just go and collect your certificate. So Kekobe is actually one of the easiest. And you can actually visit their website. They have 
uh, they, they've laid out a summary of the whole uh, application process till the end. So I think I'm done with the questions. Uh, moderator, Mr. Kevin Kwasa, unless there are other questions or other concerns, over to you, Kevin. Uh, yes, so I think that I think that's been great. Uh, I don't see any more questions coming in on my end, unless uh, uh, I do see one more from David O'Wall. Yes, what yes, I've actually David seen to... one from David O'Wall. So David O'Wall asks, uh, what advice would you give a team that is better testing a social network, a platform mobile app? How can they protect themselves? A uh, very good question, David. The first thing you need to do is have or rather sign non-disclosure agreements with each and every person whom you discuss uh, this uh, better uh, or rather this social networking platform. The non-disclosure agreement becomes handy because uh, uh, sometimes you may not have uh, developed your idea such that it has reached that point where, where you can actually uh, identify the intellectual property right that you have and you want to register it. Again, funds become a problem because probably you want, first of all, to share this idea. So probably you can get investors who can, again, because registration, again, is a cost and uh, it's not a very small cost. So I would advise at this point is uh, disclose on a need to know basis. And before you disclose, ensure that to any person that you disclose this to, uh, you sign at least an, a non-disclosure agreement. Then again, uh, consider also having legal counsel or a lawyer to oversee the process so that they can know the right time. At which, first of all, they can identify whether there is any registrable intellectual property right. Because again, if it's something which is not novel, uh, you may want to you know, look at other options, maybe register it as something simple with the Kenya Copyright Board, or if it qualifies, you know, uh, as being patentable, also register it as a patent. So I'd advise an NDA and ensure that uh, you have a legal counsel or you have a lawyer on your side uh, so that you're protected at all times and disclose on a need to know basis. I believe I've answered, uh, I've answered you, David Over. Then I can see another question, uh, which is uh, if my employee invents a new product or process, who will own the right to the patent? So again, as I said, uh, intellectual property has actually grown over time. Initially, uh, employment contracts were very basic. They never anticipated a situation where an employee would actually come up with an invention. So currently you find that most of the employment contracts actually provide that. If an employee comes up with an invention during the course of his employment or her employment, or during the hours of his or her employment, the same belongs to the employer. So you'll find this in most of the contracts. Uh, so again, it's a question of how, of when and how. Because if I come up with an invention outside my scope of employment, my course of employment, and outside my employment hours, ideally I should own that patent. But you'll find some employment contract will actually say that any invention, regardless, developed by its employee, will actually be owned by the employer. So an ideal situation is if you come up as an employee with an invention, using either your employee, employer's resources or during your employment hours or in the course of your employment, most probably it should belong to your employer. Again, it's a question of facts. So I believe I've answered that question on who owns patent developed by an employee. So again, we are open to any questions we may have and uh, I'm quite grateful to the viewers. Uh, the webinar is quite interactive, so keep those questions coming, guys. Keep those questions coming. <laughs> uh, I, I have I've seen a question that I, I can answer as well, Andrew, while you're there. Uh, I've seen someone has asked whether 
having an employee, uh, an employee who invents a new product or process who own the rights to the patents. That is not automatic. Uh, and that's a much deeper question that you need to you need to look at your employment contracts and make sure that they they um, ring fence you from uh, giving out to more, uh, intellectual property that's generated during the time. Uh, I don't know what what do you think of that, Andrew? Yes, boss, I agree with you. Uh, basically, I I'll go back to the employment contract and see what it provides. And as I said, most of the current employment contracts, they will basically provide that any invention, because you'll find that uh, sometimes, most of the times, or most of the invention that probably we have in mind here is uh, an employee has actually seen a problem within the course of the employment and they've come up with a solution. So you will find that the employer will actually want to own that. So again, we'll go back to the employment contract and see what it provides. Okay. I can see, I can see sorry, sorry for that. I can see a question mm -hmm. from David uh, Les, uh, Lesinko, and the question is, uh, what is the enforceability of non-disclosure agreements in Kenya? Uh, David, to answer you, they are enforceable, provided that, because we also look at the governing law and the dispute resolution clause, if any, in that contract. So if governing law is Kenyan law, then it's actually enforceable in Kenya, unless otherwise. But generally, to answer you, your question, in black and white, Non-disclosure agreements are enforceable in Kenya. Thanks, thanks, Tim. So I hand over to Nairobi Garage team and the moderator, Kevin, unless there are any questions or any further questions. And thanks everyone for the questions. Keep them coming, we're still here to answer all your questions. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, I would like us to wrap up. So thank you very much, Andrew and Kevin, for the awesome session. Uh, it was very informative. I'm sure most of the members agree with me and all the attendees agree with me. Thank you for all the people who have attended. You each get a free day pass to use at any of our spaces. So something will be dropped in your email shortly. If you're interested to know about more about Nairobi Garage, email us at join at nairobigarage.com. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.